coordination chemistry is actually very dear to my heart. And the reason why it's very dear to my heart is because I'm an inorganic chemistry by training when I went to grad school in Santa Barbara. Um, I wanted to do some work. It's always been my dream since high school to figure out a way to get energy cheap. I remember in high school, I was thinking about the hydrogen economy because it was introduced even back then in the 70s and 60s that you can take water, split it, get hydrogen, and then use hydrogen as a fuel. And when you use hydrogen in the fuel with ox oxygen in the air, you get water back. And what is more cleaner than water in the environment? In fact, we have a shortage of water in the environment. So when I went to Santa Barbara in my first year, I was interviewing different um, research directors, uh, research professors, and I was basically looking for professors who were doing some sort of work in, in this particular field. And there were a couple of professors there. One professor was uh, Richard Watts. He was my um, graduate research advisor. He was doing some research uh, with iridium chemistry. And his group had recently discovered, in fact, this chemical right here, okay, this chemical right here, recently discovered that um, iridium can take what we call bipyridine. You guys will see what bipyridine is. And bipyridine will flip so that the iridium will bind the nitrogen and the carbon. Okay, so that was predating because what happens generally is that the nitrogen better coordinated coordinating atoms for the metal. But in this particular case, one of the bipyridines flipped so that it was the carbon. See, this, this generally would be a nitrogen right here. Let me see if I can't do this. Uh, generally, bipyridine is this. And I'm gonna introduce you to organic nomenclature as well, because we're gonna be doing that a lot um, in this particular section. Generally, bipyridine is this right here where you've got two nitrogen. This right here is a pyridine, is a pyridine. Pyridine is a six-membered ring. One of the carbons replaced by nitrogen. So this chemical right there is called bipyridine. It's called a ligand because it attached to the metal. You guys are used to ligand because the ethylene diamine that you guys uh, used in experiment six in the lab, ethylene diamine is a ligand. Ligands are, are just uh, normal terminology for um, an atom or a compound or ions that bonds to the metal. So this is a ligand. So instead of nitrogen bonding to iridium here, what happened was that this thing flip Nitrogen's over here, and what we had was carbon. So that was called a uh, orthometallation. So they were doing that, and they were trying to figure out, OK, these things really have good photophysical. That means that you can shine light on them. They'll hold on to the light, the energy of the light, store it for a little bit, and then transfer that energy to something else, like water. You can shine light on these chemicals. It's called a photocatalyst that chemical will hold on to the energy from the light. And then if it attacks another substrate like water, then it can transfer that energy to water and split up water to hydrogen and oxygen. So I was really interested in that, okay? And I did a lot of work in terms of these orthometallated compound. One of the, um, one of the uh, ligands that I used was this right here, okay? And then uh, characterize it, I got my PhD based, based on that work. A uh, person in our group went and worked for a um, professor at USC, and there were some Japanese workers there. And uh, they realized that, um, let's see. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they recently figured out how to uh, take carbon dioxide in the water and get fuel from it. They're actually, uh, there's, um, statement in the uh, chat there that it's pretty fascinating that they're doing research now where they're actually exploring for people settling in Mars. And certainly uh, NASA has been really innovative in terms of uh, finding resources that human need in order to uh, sustain life in Mars. So 
we are living in a fascinating time in terms of things that we are finding every day in, in science. So, so thanks for that comment. But going back to this, okay, um, one of my uh, fellow graduate student went to USC. They worked with a professor there. Uh, they started to make these compounds. And then some Japanese workers got a hold of some of these chemicals. And instead of shining light to them, what they did was they ran electricity, electrons through them. And they found out these things glow and hold their light. And so they figured they're very similar to organic uh, diodes. And diodes are basically like light emitting diodes. They're, they're really highly efficient light bulbs that doesn't require a lot of power. But these things could be used for different colors of, of the rainbow. And uh, one thing turned to another and they started patenting these compounds. And now if you look at your iPhone or maybe your TV, you're going to see that those screens are made by OLED optical light emitting diodes. And the chemicals responsible for that are the same chemicals that I use in graduate school, okay? These things right here, okay? So um, again, the lesson, the lesson learned there is that the people who were initially work with the compounds are generally not the people who get rich from the compound, okay? Or not, do not get rich from the discovery. It's the people who find a utilization for that compound that is uh, <laughs> that gets the richest down the end. But uh, I like to say that that was my claim to fame in terms of my work in graduate school uh, and how it made its way to, to the device that everyone uses every day, okay? But um, we're still trying to find the magic catalyst. We're still trying to find, and there's many work out there where you can shine light on a chemical that chemical will hold that light and then split water. If you can find a way to split water to hydrogen in a cost-effective way, please don't forget me because uh, you heard it here first, okay? You're gonna be a billionaire probably a hundred times over if you can find a catalyst that can split water cheaply. We've been trying to do this for the past, well, for my lifetime basically. Anyway, um, just want to put that out there that these things that you cover in chemistry really do have applications in the real world, okay? They do have applications in the real world. And sometimes it's, a, it's as close as the uh, device that you are using every day. First thing that we need to learn about coordination chemistry is some of the fundamentals. The things that you need to know is that Coordination chemistry usually deals with transition metals. Transition metals are those in which the D orbital starts to fill, okay? And you guys know about transition metals because these are the transition metals right here, okay? And the reason why transition metals are important is because they have D orbitals. So the D orbitals are orbitals that are either have electrons or they can accept electrons. And when they can accept electrons, that means a ligand can bind to them. And if a ligand can bind to them, then you basically have a coordination compound, just like what you guys did in experiment six, where you had the nickel and then these ethylene diamine chemicals are able to bind to the nickel, okay? And that reaction was fairly easy. All you had to do was mix it, stir it up a little bit, cool it down, and voila, you had, you had that, those chemicals. So you can see that some reactions are, are pretty easy. Uh, even my reactions in graduate school wasn't that difficult. You have to cook it a little bit, but you get about 80% yield. That's how much um, product you get uh, based on the starting material. And you guys know about this because you guys did experiment number six. But Whenever we deal with coordination chemistry, we deal with, with the metal. And if we're dealing with the metal, that means that you need to know what the charge of the metal is, okay? You need to understand a little bit about transition uh, metals. And what I would like you guys to know is that uh, the charges is going to generally depend on one, what it reacts with, but also know that these, transition metals have 
remember they they're in the the third period and so they have four s electrons filled before the 3d hopefully i'm jarring your memory for from chem 200 so um like scandium it's 4s2 3d1 that's the electron configuration now why is it a 3d and not a 4s remember that because the 4s um electrons can penetrate into the nucleus more efficiently so they're more stable even though it's further out and so that those are the orbitals that get fill out first when you do the electron configuration now that the 4s orbitals fill out then you start filling the 3d uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that when we look at the electron configuration but uh, because the 4s orbitals are filled first whenever you ionize the metal Ionized just means you re remove the electron so that now it becomes an ion, a cation. The electrons first come out from the 4s orbital. Why the 4s? Because even though the 4s is much more stable than the 3d, and that's why it fills first in the electron configuration, the 4s is in the fourth shell. And the fourth, the fourth shell extends further out from the nucleus which means that it's going to take less energy to ionize those electrons, to remove those electrons. So when you ionize the transition metals, you're always ripping off the electrons from the S orbital first. Okay, so um, these are the different oxidation states for the different transition metals. Scandium plus three, okay? Usually what happens is that scandium, remember, has a electron configuration of noble gas, 4s2, 3d1. So when you remove the electrons, you remove the 4s and then the d orbital. So that's why it's a plus three. Titanium right here, it can, it can have a plus two, a plus three, or plus four. The ones in purple here are the common charge. That is a majority of the chemicals prefer those oxidation states, but the other oxidation states are also uh, attainable. You can also have plus two, plus three for vanadium, but it prefers plus four and plus five, okay? Uh, and again, the, these are how many electrons you remove from the, the, the metal so that now the number of protons compared to the number of electrons are going to be greater, either four protons greater than electrons or three protons greater than the electrons. That's how you get the, the positive charge. So anyway, it goes up through manganese and then it starts dropping down as you go across the periodic table, okay? So here, here they are again, periodic trends. You can take a look at this and remember that these are your transition metals and the oxidation stage generally goes up as you go across the periodic table, except for transition metal, it goes up to manganese and then it drops down to zinc. But um, again, again, depending on the valence electrons, you're going to get oxidation states that corresponds to either electrons being removed or electrons being added if you have a non-metal right here. But we're concentrating on transition metals for the most part, okay? Um, so you can watch this movie in terms of atomic radius. That is sort of summarized here. It's called the lanthanide contraction. Why is the size of uh, these atoms important? The size is important because when they, when a ligand attacks the metal, it's going to, it's going to uh, the number of ligands is going to be dependent on the size of the metal. Okay, um, if the metal is small that, and the ligands come in, there's only so many ligands that can, can surround that metal before the ligands sort of crowd each other. If the metal is large and the ligands come in, you can accommodate more ligands around that metal because there's more space surrounding that particular metal. So the size is certainly important in terms of um, coordination. Coordination has to do with how the... Uh, ligands attack the metal. So 
you guys should recognize the lanthanide contraction. First of all, let me remind you that as you go down the periodic table, the size of the atom gets larger. And the reason why it gets larger is because the shells are, okay, as you go from the fourth shell to the fifth shell, the electrons are going to be found further out. And what determines the size of an atom? It's the valence shell, okay? The further, the further it extends out, uh, the further you consider the size of that particular atom or element. So what happens as you go down the periodic table is that the, the size of the element gets larger because the shells is going to be increasing. And so here you see the first series, this would be like vanadium, chromium, manganese, nickel. So these are elements right here. Okay, these are elements right here. First row, it's called first row transition metals. And then this would be second and third row transition metals. Second and third row transition metals. But look what happens to their size. The second and third row transition metals are certainly larger than the first, but they're, I mean, the, their size are, are compa compatible. The second and third row transition metals are about the same size. And that's called the lanthanide contraction. And the reason why they're about the same size, even though you're going to one level deeper, let me just show you this in the periodic table. You see how these elements right here are in the fifth period, and these elements right here are in the sixth period. But look at the sixth period. Let me clear this so that you guys can see that. So going here is just basically doing some Chem 200 review. Look at the sixth period. As you go from lanthium to haptium, um, I don't have it here. I wonder if I have a periodic table that shows that. But if you look at a regular periodic table, if you go from lanthium, lanthanide to haptium, you actually go down to the uh, rare earth. You go to the F orbital elect, uh, elements. And so what does that mean? It means that, so as you go from lanthium, to haptium, 57, you actually go through this right here, the lanthanide series. And as you go, as you march across through that, and then finally, when you get to LU, you go back to haptium. So between lanthium, 57, and haptium, 72, you actually have 14 protons that are in the nucleus uh, increasing. And so if you're just looking at these elements over here, okay, the ones in the sixth period, you have something called the lanthium contraction. The, the protons are going to be attracting the electrons. Why? Because they're, they're positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. So if you go from lanthium to haptium, you actually increase the number of protons by 14. That means that the electron clouds are going to be attracted to, to the nucleus to a greater uh, efficiency because there's more protons. And so because the electron cloud is going to collapse it's going to cause that size to decrease. And so that's exactly what we see right here, okay? That's exactly what we see right here in this particular uh, slide. If you, if you didn't have the lanthium contraction, then the third series would be probably up here, but because you have the lanthium contra contraction, you have the, the two, series of elements, second and third row transition metals, about the same size, okay? So um, keep that in mind when you're thinking about size of the metal. Now here's the electron configuration um, diagram. And remember, this will just be for the uh, first row transition metals, but it can easily apply to second and third row transition metals because remember, elements in the same family are going to have similar electron configuration, of, but of course, it's going to be one shell further. It's gonna be one shell further. But scandium is 3D, 1, 4S2, titanium. I, I actually like to say it's 4S2, 3D2, but here it's giving you the d orbitals first. I always like to say the 4S2 because that's what's filled first, and then 3D2. Here it's uh, 4S2, 3D4, okay? So when 
you ionize these elements, these electrons are removed first. And then depending on how many electrons you're removing, then you start picking off the electrons into the orbital. Okay, you start picking off the electrons into the orbital. So uh, a scan, a vanadium plus two. Well, vanadium plus two would be the removal of those two electrons in the s orbital. And what we have is um, the number of electrons remaining would be what we call D3. Okay, D3. Why is it a D3? Because that's the number of electrons in the d orbital. And you're going to need to know that um, terminology because the number of electrons in the d orbital is going to be important in terms of the type of uh, compound that is formed and the geometry that forms. So suppose I have um, vanadium or chromium three uh, plus three. Okay, that's the, the charge. So whenever you have a chromium plus three, all you've got to do is say, okay, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six electrons in the valence shell, because now what we're going to do is count the total number of electrons in the S and the D orbital. So that's going to be 4S2, 3D4, but six total in, in the outermost shell. So if it's chromium plus three, that means we're going to take the, the six electrons in that valence sh shell, take away three. And so what remains is three electrons in the d orbital. So uh, a chromium plus three would be called d3 because that's the number of electrons in the d orbital. Suppose I have a cobalt, cobalt three. Okay, how many electrons in the d orbital? Don't make it hard on yourself. Don't go into the electron configuration and say, okay, cobalt has 4s2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3d7. Take away two, take away one. So you have uh, five, uh, you have 3d6. Uh, Do it this way. You have, look at cobalt first, which is right here in the periodic table count from the edge, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's a total of nine electrons in the valence shell, the S, the 4S, and the 3D, total of nine. You just have to count across from the edge. And now it's a chromium three, which means that it's a plus three ions. What does that mean? You're taking what you're, you have nine electrons, you're taking away three, that means there's six electrons remaining. It's going to be in the d orbital. So you just say d6, OK? So something like niobium 2. Niobium 2 would be 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 minus 2, that'll be a 3D. That'll be a d3. It's going to be, you want to do it that way rather than overthink it. How about palladium 4? Palladium four. Again, count from the edge. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten minus four, six. So it's a it's a D6. Okay. And why is that important? Because you need to know the number of electrons in the D orbital after it gets ionized. After it gets ionized. The electrons from the S orbitals are always going to be removed first. And then the electrons from the d orbitals are going to be removed next, depending if you have two or more electrons, or you have more than two electrons that are being removed. So please keep that in mind. It's it's a very simple uh, shortcut. And in the past, students would get confused because they would overthink it. They would first write down the electron configuration for that particular element, remove the electrons from the s orbital, remove the electrons from the d orbital, and get to the answer. But if you just count how many electrons total in that last shell, and that last shell is both the S and the D, and just subtract that amount, then you will have the number of electrons in the D orbital. And again, it's important that you understand how to do that because the number of electrons in the D orbital will give you information. That So we're looking at the um, chemistry between the ligands and the metal. And so in any discussion between the ligands and the metal, you have to consider the Lewis acid, 
Lewis-based situation. Remember that Lewis acid are chemicals that are going to be electron acceptors. That would be your metal because they have d orbitals that can accept those electrons. And when we talk about uh, metals, then we're going to have to look at the d orbitals in, in detail. Lewis base are going to be the ligands with the electrons to donate, okay? And ligands, again, are those secondary chemicals that are going to bind to the metal. And so uh, examples of ligands that you will see is like water or ammonia or chlorine or cyanide, any chemical that have lone pair electrons, they have to be lone pair electrons. So that's what you see right here. These are the metals, they have d orbitals. And you guys should remember the different types of d orbitals. And it's all based on how the orbitals, how, how the lobes are orient, orientated in 3D space in which they do get their name. So let's take a look at this right here. Whenever the orbitals are along the x and the y axis, then it's called dx squared minus y squared. Okay, when it's along the x and the y axis. So it's easy to remember. If the orbitals or the lobes are along the x and the y axis, it's dx squared minus y squared. If the main lobe is along the z axis with a donut in between, then it's a dz squared orbital. Okay. Um, and then the others, the others are dxy. They're, Remember, we're looking at the Cartesian coordinate. Cartesian coordinate has x, y, and z axis. So the orbitals are, are going to be along the x, y, the x, z, or the y, z. But they're pointing in between those axes. So see this right here? This right here is be pointing between this axis and this axis right here. Uh, I believe that one of them is the, um, this is the x axis, and this is the, um, let me just make sure that I, I have these pictures correct. Uh, yeah, this is the x, this is the y, and this is the z. So if you look at these orbitals right here, you're going to see that it's pointing between the x, the z, and the y axis. So this is the y axis. This is the z axis, and these things are pointing between those. The lobes are between those axes, and so that's why it's called dyz. This right here is pointing in between the x and the z axis. This is the z, this is the x. So, um, if you have an axis, it's pointing in between that, and so that's the xz orbital. Um, this is pointing in between the x, y axis. Remember that this is the x and this is the y. So it's going to be this plane right here. So these things are pointing in between those axes. And so that would be the dy, x, or the dxy orbital. And there's only five of them. The xz, the yz, and the uh, xy are easy to remember because the lobes are going to be be pointing along the name. The lobes are going to be pointing between the y and the uh, z axis for the dyz, etc. So if you remember that, then you can draw these d orbitals. Okay, and hopefully you remember these from Chem two hundred. Anyway, let me move on. Ligands are going to have a pair of electrons. Water, I said, is a, a ligand because remember, water is this chemical right here. It's got two hydrogen, but it's also got two lone pairs. And those lone pairs are depicted right here. They can bind to the d orbitals of a metal. And then when they combine, you get a Lewis, Lewis acid, Lewis base combination. You also get something called a complex. What's so complex? Complicated about these complex, it's just the name we give it. Okay, you guys probably were introduced to this in, in your experiment number six. Whenever a metal binds a ligand, it's called a complex. Okay, um, so here they are right here. These are uh, different metal complex. These are ammonia, NH3. This is your silver, um, 
actually this is cobalt right here and this might be like a chlorine so that's a transition metal complex and in this particular complex you've got four ammonia two chlorines and a cobalt so there are six ligands four of them are am ammonia two of them are chlorines and then you have a metal center okay and whatever atoms are directly bonded to the metal center are called the coordination sphere. Coordination spheres are any atoms or ligands that are directly bonded to the metal or connected to the metal. That's unlike this right here, this chloride, you see, that's a counter ion. That chloride's a counter ion. Why is it a counter ion? Because this cobalt is plus three. That means in order for this compound to be neutral, it's going to have to have a counter ion negative three. It's like magnesium chloride. Magnesium is plus two. Chlorines are negative one apiece. So the whole thing is neutral. When you put this magnesium chloride in water, it breaks down to magnesium ions and two chloride ions like that. The, because they're not directly bonded, they separate through the hydration of water. If you put this chemical in water, it breaks down to cobalt, NH3, six plus three, that would be one ion. And then it would have three chlorides that the water is going to hydrate. So you basically get four ions in solution when you dissolve this chemical in water. The metal complex stays intact, okay, it stays intact if it's stable, if it's stable. So the, the, the intact chemical are going to be the chemicals that are within the coordination sphere. The chlorides are not in the co coordination sphere because they're counter ions. So uh, let me go ahead and move on from this. And again, those are chemicals in the coordination sphere, okay? Counter ions are chemicals so that the whole thing is neutral, okay? Now, there's two terminologies that you will need. Uh, if you guys are in lab, take a look at the coordination chemistry activity. Coordination number is with, is with respect to the metal, okay? How many bonds are to the metal? So this right here, it's gonna, the cobalt has six bonds. It's gonna have a coordination number of six. How many ligands are actually uh, attached to that cobalt, there's six ammonia, six amines, so the ligand number is six, just like what you see right here, where maybe each ball represents NH3, okay? Um, that right there would be a coordination number of two and the ligand number of two, okay? Coordination number of two, ligand number of two. That right there is, look at the metal, how many bonds are coming out of the metal? One, two, three, four, five, six. Coordination number of six, but a ligand number of three. Why is it a ligand number of three? Because that's considered one ligand. It's called a bidentate ligand, where one chemical binds the metal at two different sites, at two different orbitals, the orbitals. So the number of ligands are three ethylene diamines in this particular case. So that's three ligands, but the coordination number is six. Coordination number has to do with respect to the metal and how many bonds that metal is giving off. So here are other examples. Okay, here are other examples. This is a coordination number of four, ligand number four. This is a coordination number five, ligand number five. That one there is coordination number six, ligand number six. Uh, here are more examples. Okay, I just want you guys to be exposed on that of that. Um, this right here, again, coordination number six, ligand number of three. So the, the donor atoms are going to be responsible for coordinating the metal. There's two donor atoms here, coordination number of two. The, the most, the geometry of these compounds, when you have two ligands around the metal is going to be one in which the ligands are are most stable, and so that would be a linear geometry. So when you have a coordination number of two, generally you have a geometry of a linear geometry. When you have a coordination number of four, 
you have two types of geometry. It could either be square planar, it's called square planar, or tetrahedral, like that. Okay. When you have a coordination number of six, then you have an octahedral geometry. You have an octahedral geometry. Uh, and what determines whether you have like a tetrahedral or a square planar? The geometry is going to depend on the metal size. That's why you need to have an idea of which metals are larger. Remember, the uh, second and third period transition metals are going to have about the same size, but they're much bigger than the first row transition metals. But if you have a transition metal that is small, okay, then it's going to get crowded once the ligand comes in. So it prefers a, a low coordination number. It's not going to accept a lot of ligands. So coordination number four versus coordination number six. On the other hand, if you have a large metal, then you're going to be able to accommodate more ligands around that metal. And so you'd have a high coordination number. Uh, the other thing that you need to think about is the, the size of the ligand. Take, for example, the halogens. Halogens can be ligands because they have uh, lone pair electrons to donate. Remember, fluorine is going to be small. And as you wait, work your way down to iodine, they're going to be larger because it's further down the periodic table. It's got a um, greater number of shells, valent shells, so they're going to be larger. So again, if you have a small ligand, then you can accommodate more ligand ar around that metal. So you'd have a high coordination number. But if you have a large ligand, then you can't really accommodate that many ligands around the metal because it gets too crowded. So you would have a low coordination number. So large metal, small coordination number. Um, small metal, uh, large metal, uh, small ligands, I mean, uh, would be high coordination number. Large ligands, low coordination number. So you just have visualize it and then you should be able to determine how many bonds that particular transition metal should accommodate either a low amount or a high amount okay so let's take a look at silver and this ligand right here is ammonia but we don't call it ammonia in coordination chemistry we call nh3 amines Okay, that's just the name we give it, amines. So NH3 has a lone pair. You guys remember the uh, Lewis structure for ammonia. And so that lone pair will bind to the metal. And here are other ligands that can bind to the metal. And they all have in common lone pairs to donate to the metal. Okay, then you also have ligands that are called polydentate ligands. And these have within the structure, two atoms that have lone pairs somewhere in the structure that can bind the metal simultaneously. That's why it's called polydentate. Poly meaning many, more than one. Dentate meaning bite, because it looks like they're biting into the ligands. So um, I'll show you an illustration of these things shortly here. But Polydentate ligands, and you guys have been exposed to these already. Ethylene diamine is a polydentate ligand. More specifically, it's called a bidentate. Bi meaning two, two bytes. Okay, so here are monodentate ligands. That is, these are the ligands that will bind the metal at one site. It's called monodentate because they only bind the metal at one site. So called monodentate ligands. Okay, even though these something like cyanide has two places that it can coordinate the metal either here or here the cyanide can't wrap itself around the cyanide can't bend like this for example and bind the metal like that because the cyanide's linear okay so it can't bend to do that that's why it's monodentate it's only going to bind a single metal at one side, okay? Um, on the other hand, chemicals that like carbonate, carbonate looks like this. This is CO3, 
2 minus. See how there's a bend right here? If there's a bend right here, that means that this thing can wrap to a metal and both oxygens can bond to the metal at the same time. That, that would be a bidentate ligand. Okay, so these are examples of monodentate ligands. Those are some of the names. Water is not called water, it's called aqua. Amines, ammonia is not called ammonia, it's called amine. NO is called nitrosyl, CO is called carbonyl. Fluorines are not fluoride, they're fluoro. Why are they, they O N N O? Because they're anionic ligands. That is, they have a negative charge. Whenever you have an anionic ligand, that is, its charge is minus, then you have to end the name with an O. Here are more examples of uh, these ligands. It's in your book. And then these right here are bidentate ligands. Notice that they have a place where they can bind the metal at two sites within one ligand. They have a place where they can bind the metal at two sites within one ligand. So that's why they're called bidentate ligands, okay? There's two places where they can bind the metal. And this right here, you guys are actually, actually familiar with this chemical. This is a chemical that you've used in lab. It's also, if you have any kids, a chemical that you should get because it's really good in terms of uh, anti-metal poisoning. It's called EDTA. And usually it's NA4 EDTA because EDTA is a minus four charge. So you need four sodiums to counteract that, counteract that negative four, okay? Sodiums are one positive one apiece. EDTA is negative four as a whole. So positive four, negative four, neutral. That's the salt. But when you remove the sodium, because again, it's a spectator ion, this is the chemical you have. EDTA stands for ethylene, diamine, tetra, acetate. Let me try and point out how the name comes from that structure. So that whenever you see EDTA, you guys can whip it out, no problem. Ethylene diamine, two carbons in organic chemistry is usually a prefix of eth. Ethanol, um, eth ethanolic acid, okay, means two carbons. So those, those are your two carbons, it's in the center. Diamine means there are two ammonias. Here's your two ammonias right there at the end of each ethylene diamine. Now, it's not really ammonia, but it's like ammonia because ammonia is NH3. That means ammonia has three bonds attached to it and the lone pair. So that's your diamine. And then acetate. This right here, if you put a hydrogen right here, that's acetic acid. So the ion of acetic acid is the acetate ion. There are four of them. One, two, three, four, and they're attached to the uh, to the amine. That's how EDTA gets its name: ethylene diamine tetra four acetate. And you see these oxygens right here? They all have lone pairs, and these nitrogens have lone pairs. So what do they do? They all one ligand. Okay, one ligand can bind a metal at six sites. And that's what it looks like right over here. And that's why these particular chemical EDTA is a good uh, poison reagent because what happens is that maybe a child uh, get, gets, they, they eat lead, lead chips, paint chips, I mean, okay? And if the lead gets into the blood system, then it's going to get adhere to the, the fatty, fatty fats in that particular child, and then it'll just stay there. And then it'll, it'll leach over time and it'll cause uh, the central ner nervous system to, to kind of break down. That's how the great, so-called the Greek, the, the Roman empire broke down. It's because they were using lead pipe. And so they were going crazy or senile because of the accumulation of lead 
uh, in their water system. But this particular chemical, as soon as it finds a metal, it'll sequester it, it'll catch it. And then because it's got these OH groups, it's going to be water soluble. So you can flush it down through your system, through your urine. Okay, and so that's why this this EDTA is a really special agent for anti poisoning of head, heavy metals, or to preserve uh, food from spoiling, because it sequesters any chemical and then it can get washed away. So that's EDTA. It's got real application. Um, here are more polyatomic ions ligands that you can use. Okay, these are the ligands. These are the chemicals it comes from, like acetic acid. What is the ligand from acetic acid? It's the acetate ion. Uh, oxalate is over here somewhere. Okay, it comes from oxalic acid. When you remove the two hydrogens, then those oxygens that have their hydrogens removed can now bind the, the metal. So it's a bidentate ligand as well. It's called oxalato. It's called oxalato. Um, so again, the, these are chelating agents right here. Okay, pretty fascinating. And we have these examples throughout nature. Hemoglobin is an example of that where we have a heme and it binds the iron at four sites. And hemoglobin actually has an iron right here. And there's a site where the oxygen can come can come in and that's what grabs the oxygen that those hemes right there and as soon as those irons grab an oxygen those heme sites will close and then as it closes the hemoglobin globin, uh, molecule will will open up the other side so that it facilitates the other heme sites to uh, accept oxygen once uh, a second oxygen binds then it closes and then it opens up the other oxygen so that again, it becomes more efficient for the second, third and fourth oxygen to bind to hemoglobin. But this is an example of coordination chemistry in living system. There are a lot of that in, the, in, in nature, vitamin B12, the zinc finger proteins, they're common. Oxy, myoglobin, chlorophylls are all examples of coordination chemical compounds. Okay, now we're not going to really study these, but I just want to expose you to them. And uh, this right here has to do with as to why these, these polydentate ligands um, combine with metal very efficiently. It's actually a thermodynamic. If you take a look at this reaction right here, you see that the nickel with water is going to be replaced by ammonia. And when that happens, you've got seven moles seven moles of reactant here, and you end up with seven moles of product. The K formation, the equilibrium constant for that is pretty big. It's four times 10 to the eighth. But look at what happens when that metal complex with water, nickel hexa um, compound binds ethylene diamine. Okay, we've got seven moles here, but here we've got Sorry, not seven moles. I, I miscounted. That, that's four moles. Three plus one is four. But you get seven moles on the product. So you go from four moles to seven moles. You get higher degree of entropy. And look at the KF value. It goes from four times 10 to the eighth to two times 10 to the 18th. So it's much more efficient in terms of binding polydentate ligand. Why? Because the entropy is increased. The entropy and is the driving. Experiment number six makes a little bit more sense in terms of what you were doing in the synthesis. You had basically a, um, uh, a nickel compound, I mean, and you were adding ethylene diamine to them and the waters are getting removed. Depending on the ratio of ligands to metals, you replace two waters for one ethylene diamines, or four waters for two ethylene diamines, or all six waters for three ethylene diamines. You're going from a coordination number of six to a coordination number of six, but you can go from a ligand number of six to a ligand number of three if you actually get to three ethylene diamine on your compound. 
okay? And because the coordination number of the meadow is six, the geometry is octahedral, whether you have salt A, salt B, or salt C. When you guys learn nomenclature for the first time, especially inorganic nomenclature, that's where you have a cation and an anion, okay? Cations are generally the, the first element. And when you're talking about salts, ionic substance, it usually consists of a metal and a non-metal, a uh, cation and an anion. One cation that is in a metal is NH4 plus. That's ammonium, but that's a cation, okay? So um, most cations are made of um, elements, metal elements in, from the transition, from the, um, from the periodic table. Okay, so suppose you have MgCl2, you would name that magnesium chloride. Okay, magnesium chloride. Uh, you name the cation, name the anion, and you don't say magnesium dichloride, even though the formula is MgCl2. And the reason why you don't say magnesium dichloride is because you already know that magnesium, common oxidation state, is plus two, chlorine common oxidation state is negative two. So when you say magnesium chloride, a formula that would fit that would be Mg plus two Cl two, because you need two chlorines to counterbalance the charge of the magnesium, okay? Same thing with, with inorganic um, complexes. You have a cation and anion. The cations are generally, well, the cation or the anion could be metal complex but they'll have a positive charge or a negative charge depending on whether it's cation or anion. And then there's the counter ion. The counter ions, what makes that whole thing neutral. If you don't have counter ion, then you're just talking about a chemical that's charged. And generally you can't isolate that as a solid material, but they do exist when you put it in water because ions by their nature will Compounds by their nature, ionic compounds by their nature in water will split into ions, okay? So think about that. Here we have a compound. This right here is the cation. It's always the first part of the formula. And the bracket indicates those elements or those atoms within the coordination sphere. Remember we talked about um, atoms in the coordination sphere. Atoms in the coordination sphere are going to be atoms that are bonded directly to the metal, okay? Either through a network or through direct bonds. And then outside that coordination sphere to counterbalance that charge is the counter ion. So uh, things in bracket will be within the coordination sphere. In this particular case, we have ammonia, we have five, we have a chlorine, and then they're all attached to cobalt. And then bromine is the counter ion. So um, we can name these things. We can name these things based on what's going on. So let's take a look at this. Um, well, the complex itself is going to call, be called, and just accept this for now, pentaamine. Amine here means NH3. The penta means five, okay? So it has five. NH3, that's pentamine. Chloro means that it's got a chlor chlorine ion. It's not chloride and that it's not chlorine. It's called chloro because it's a ligand and it ends in an O because it has, it's a negative charge. Chloro and then the metal cobalt and then the charge of the metal. Okay, the charge of the metal, cobalt three. Uh, so, so that's how we would name this particular compound right there, okay? Um, remember that the ligands that are anionic, anionic just means that they are charged, and ligands can either be neutral or charged, okay? Um, negatively charged. Ligands generally are not positively charged, okay? They're negatively charged because they'll have, they're the one that's bringing in electrons to bind to the metal. Anyway, if they're charged, negatively charged, then they end in an O. Uh, chloro, fluoro, uh, nitro, okay, cyano, all these are uh, fra fragments of compounds, 
but now serves as ligands that binds to the metal. So, and they're charged, by the way. Um, water is not called water, H2O, their name aqua. NH3 is not named ammonia, it's called amine. So some ligands have special names like ammonia, which is amine and water, which is aqua. Okay, and you generally use Greek prefix, di, tri, tetra, penta, uh, hexa, uh, hepta is seven, octa is eight, nona is nine, deca is 10. You usually use Greek prefix to indicate numbers. But this is important, if the name already has a Greek prefix that is within the name, like ethylene, diamine. You see how ethylene diamine has a di within the name? Then you can't use that Greek prefix. Like if you have two ethylene diamine, you don't say uh, diethylene nickel uh, compound because it's too redundant. Instead of using di to indicate numbers, you use a secondary prefix, bis, tris, tetrakis, pentakis, hexa, hexakis. Okay, use that secondary to indicate uh, numbers. So if you have two ethylene diamine within the compound, uh, then the prefix to use is bis, 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 B I S, ethylene diamine. Okay, so, so keep that in mind. If the ligand already has a Greek prefix for numbers within the name, then you go to the secondary prefix. And that's what these are. Okay, so, so these are just rules of the game. For example, this compound right here, uh, bipyridine. Bipyridine is this compound. You guys will be exposed to this a lot. I think I talked to you guys about this. This is right here, bipyridine. Notice that bipyridine already has a bi in its name. It's already got a bi in its name. It's got a Greek prefix in its name. So if you have two or three bipyridine in a complex, then you don't say di or tri, you say bis or tris. So this particular compound with three bipyridine would be tris bipyridine iridium three. Okay. So Keep that in mind. If the complex is an anion, what is an anion? Well, this is the cation right here. That's the cation. This is the anion portion right here. So if the complex is negatively charged. Then you have to change the suffix of the metal to ATE. Okay, change the suffix of the metal to ATE. So um, if well, now this right here, you'll see that example is, is positive, but suppose that this ammonia was a negative charge uh, species, like what's negative charge? Let's say that we have six chlorines here, COCl6, okay? And cobalt is plus three. Cobalt being plus three and chlorine being negative one, would make this whole thing minus three. This whole thing would be minus three. Therefore, you need a cation to neutralize that net charge, something like three sodiums, Na3, okay, Na3. This particular chemical would be called sodium, name the cation first, and then the ligands, uh, hexachloro, and then instead of saying cobalt three, you say cobaltate. You put an ATE at the end of cobalt. So now it's called cobaltate and then the charge of the metal, cobaltate three. And again, you'll see examples of that. So if the complex is an anion, that is the complex within the bracket is negatively charged, you gotta add an ATE to the metal ending doesn't change the charge based on what you figured out, okay? It's still a plus three, but the whole complex is negative. The whole complex is negative. That's why you, you indicate that 
the, the cobalt is an anion complex, part of the anion complex, and you have to give it an ATE ending. So you'll see some examples of that shortly here. Okay, so let's summarize what I just talked to you guys about. When you're writing a formula, always write the cation and then the anion, positive before negative. Uh, make sure that the charge of the cation is R balanced with the charge of the anion. It's got to be electrical neutral. MgCl2, magnesium plus two, chlorines negative one apiece. And with two chlorines, it's going to be negative two. So plus two, negative two equals zero. It's got to be electrically neutral. Okay, the cation and the anion have to be equal and opposite. Equal and opposite. P positive and negative, when you add them up, adds up to zero. Okay. Um, for the complex ion, neutral ligands are written before the anion, um, anionic ligands. Okay, so when you're writing the formula, and remember the formula is the metal followed by the ligands, that is what is attached to the metal. You write the neutral ligands first, followed by the negative charge ligands, the anionic ligands. That's just the uh, nomenclature we use. And then, um, Again, that, that's just part of the, uh, the nomenclature. And then if it's charge, you got to make sure that you place a bracket for all the compounds. Well, all, everything within the coordination sphere. The bracket represents all atoms that are connected within the coordination sphere. And then, of course, that whole thing will be a charge, either positive or negative, and it has to be counter balanced by the counter ions. So the whole complex is positive two within that bracket, then you're going to need a counter ion that's negative two. Okay. So so that's formula. That's the formula. And again, we'll take a look at some of that example shortly here. Uh, when you name this, now this is writing out the name. Okay. The, the formula is just writing the elements or the um, abbreviation for the ligands like H2O would be H2O and H3. Uh, carbonyl would be CO. Uh, bipyridine, you don't type out bipyridine. You, you type it as BPY. And then on the side, you define it BPY equals 2,2 two, two bipyridine. So that's the formula. Uh, for naming, this is like the written elements and the ligands. Okay, this is how you do it. Again, cation before anions, the positive over the before the negative. And then within the complex, name the ligands in alphabetical order. Okay, so the way you name the, the formula is you write the metal followed by the ligands and then the bracket. But when you name it, you write the ligand name, all the ligands name in alphabetical order, and then the metal comes at the very end. Okay, you're spelling it out. So you write the ligands in alphabetical order. Okay, neutral ligands generally have the molecular name except for water, which is aqua and uh, NH3, which is a uh, amine. Okay, Th those are neutral ligands. Um, if it's anionic, you drop the, you end it with an O. Like chloride, you don't use chloride, you use chloro. You drop the IDE and end it with O. Fluoride becomes um, fluoro, okay, um, NO3 nitrate becomes nitro. So you just have to get a good list of what these ligands are named, and there's going to be a list uh, that you saw from last time, okay. Um, and then the number of prefix the, the denotes the number of particular ligand, like penta means five, Okay, di means two. And if it's one, you don't put mono. You don't put mono. You don't say mono water or mono aqua. You just say aqua. If there's no prefix in, in that before that ligand, then it's implied that you only have one of them. Okay. And then, of course, the oxidation state of the metal. That's very important. Why? Because remember, transition metals, uh, ex with the exception of zinc, cadmium, and silver they have variable charge. Some of them will be plus three, some of them will be plus five. You need to know what the charge, how many electrons it's given up. And if 
it's ambiguous, that is, sometimes it does this or that, then you have to tell the audience how many electrons is given up within the name. Cobalt three, it means that cobalt has given up three electrons, okay? It's a cobalt plus three cation. And now you, to figure out the charge of the complex, you look at the charge of the metal and the charge of any of the ligands, and then you add them all up. So again, you'll see how that operates when we do nomenclature. And then of course, uh, like I said, uh, for anionic complex, you're going to name, um, you're going to give those name um, ATE ending, ATE ending. So let's take a look at this right here, okay? The way you name things is write down everything you know about that complex. Don't just start naming it off. Right now, I know that I have a chromium, okay? Chromium. Uh, I have an EN, and I know that's ethylene diamine. And you guys should know that because you've been exposed to it enough times. EN means ethylene diamine. It's the abbreviation we use for that ligand rather than spell it out. Uh, F is fluoro. Notice I give it a O ending because O halogens are negatively charged. And then NO3 is nitrate, but that's not a ligand. That's a counter ion. So, to name this, you look at the ligands, E, F, these are the ligands right here. And you can see that if you do your alphabet, E comes before F. So you're gonna do ethylene diamine first, and then notice there are two of them. So you're gonna put not diethylene diamine, but bis, because you already have a di right there. So it's bisethylene diamine. And then followed, even though this is a B, Okay, I'm going to do the alphabetical order based on the name of the ligand. Okay, based on the name of the ligand. Um, e comes before F. Fluoro, um, that is, and there's two of them, so you would put di. Okay, di, fluoro, not bis. This would be secondary, but fluoro doesn't have a Greek prefix within it. So you just say difluoro. And then chromium. What you need to do is you need to figure out what the charge of the chromium is. You know that nitrate. You should know that nitrate is a negative one. So this right here is a negative one. That means this whole thing is a positive one. That whole uh, metal complex is a positive one. The ethylene diamines are neutral. The fluorines are negative one apiece. So what you have here is um, the fluorines are negative one apiece. And so what needs to happen is that the fluorine with a negative two plus the chromium, whatever that is, is equal to positive one. Why positive one? Because the and the counter ions negative one. So that whole complex has to be positive one. The sum of the charges within the complex have to equal the, the total charge. So what plus negative one equals positive one? Well, that has to be positive three. Okay, you have to figure it out that way. Positive three and negative two, remember ethylene diamine's neutral, equals oops, positive one positive one. And so that would be chromium three. That would be the charge of the uh, metal. That's how you would name these things. Or at least how you would analyze the compound, the, the formula, so you know how to name these things. Then just string it together. Okay, just string it together. Bisethylene diamine. We already said that. Bisethylene diamine. Difluoro. We already said that. Okay, and then chromium, the metal comes last, and then we say three, because that's the charge. And then finally, we just say nitrate. If there was two nitrogens here, suppose there's two nitrogens here, nitrates here, we don't say dinitrate, we just say nitrate, okay? Because we know that the nitrate, the anion, we know what that charge is. If there was indeed two nitrates there, then that means that 
the negative two nitrates would have to be equal to a positive two cation, and therefore the cation would have to be positive two. But that's not the case here. There's only one nitrate, one NO3, and that chemical is called nitrate. So that's how we name these, this thing right here. Let me clear this so that you guys can see that. Bisethylene diamine difluoral chromium three nitrate. That's how you name it. Take a look at this one right here, the second one. Uh, the cations, potassium. So you're going to write that down. And there's only one potassium. If there was three, you would, you would still just say potassium as a name. And you know that if there was three potassium, then that means the anion portion has to be a negative three. But the fact that there's only one potassium means that the anion portion, this portion right here, is just a negative one. They have to be equal and opposite in this, this particular case. Then let's take a look at the ligands. We've got NH3, which is amine. And we have two of those. So we have diamine. OK, there's two NH3 right here. And then we have C2O4. If you're not familiar with C2O4, that's a very common um, ligand. That's oxalate. Oxalic acid is H2C2O4. That's oxalic acid. So when you remove the hydrogen and makes it make it a ligand, it's called oxolato. Oxolato. Why oxolato? Why is it an ato? And the N, an O in the end, because it's an anionic ligand. So it's not oxal oxalate ligand, it's oxolato. Okay, oxolato. And there's two of them. So uh Oxalato doesn't have a Greek prefix in it. So again, it would be just di in that particular case. And then we have cobalt. And then we have to figure out what the charge is. The oxalate ligands are going to be negative two. C2O4 is a negative two ligand. So the fact that we have two oxalato means that that right there is negative four. Okay, let me clear that for you. So this right here is a negative four. Amines are, it's negative four, amines are neutral. So if we have oxalato as negative four and we have cobalt and the whole thing has to be negative one, negative one, okay? Why negative one? Because look at the potassium. There's only one potassium. That means that the anion has to be negative one. So negative four plus what equals negative one? The cobalt's gotta be positive three, positive three, okay? So we would say that cobalt is three. And then the fact that it's an anion, we would put cobaltate as the suffix. So yeah, there's a lot of work, but it's not that difficult if you remember the rules, if you remember the rules. So let's take a look at um, the how to name this thing as I show you. So let me clear this real quick. Okay. And potassium, cation first. Diamine, A before O. Okay, diamine, A before O. Uh, dioxolato, dioxolato, right here, dioxolato. And you don't put a space between the, the ligands. You just run it together, okay? Diamine dioxolato. You do put a space between the cation and the anion. See how there's a space right here? You do put a space right there. But otherwise, all the letters run together, just like you have over here. Everything runs together. There is a space right there between the cation and the anion. So dioxalato and then cobaltate. Why eight? Because this, this cobalt is an anion. It's negatively charged. And then we say three, okay, we say three. So that, that's how you would name that particular compound. This next one, that's potassium right there. Okay, that's potassium right there. So uh, let me clear this so that you got we can we have a clear. So that's potassium. 
And again, you do not say try potassium. If you do that, it's wrong. You just say potassium. Okay. Then um, gold is gold. The Greek name we use is arium. Or the Latin, it's actually Latin, arium. So you could say gold or arium. That's why the, the symbol for gold in the periodic table is not G or GD, it's AU. It comes from the Latin name because it's a metal from antiquity. We, we've known about this particular element for, for thousands and thousands of years. So when we had a symbol for it, we used that particular uh, symbol from antiquity. Anyway, and then we have cyanide, cyanide, C-N, but cyanide's a negative anion, so we say cyano, cyano, okay? Why? Because it's negative anion. And there's four of them, so we say tetra. So to name this, we would say potassium first. Well, we need to figure out, before we jump the gun, we need to figure out the charge of gold. So this right here is positive three. That means this whole thing has to be negative three. Okay, they have to be equal and opposite. So CN, there's four of them. There's four of them. So that's minus four. The gold plus the CN, negative four equals negative three. Okay, the sum of the charges has to be equal to the total charge. That complex is negative three. Why? Because there's three potassiums. Each potassium is plus one. So therefore, the anion has to be negative three. What plus negative four equals negative three? That's got to be positive one. So the gold is a one in this particular case. But also notice that the complex is an anion, that is its negative charge. So we say gotate, A-T-E, or R8. R8 is the correct way of doing this because we use the Latin name. So the name for this would be potassium, Tetracyano R81. That's what you see right here. Potassium. Notice I didn't say try potassium. I just said potassium. Tetracyano, tetra meaning four, uh, R81. Okay. And the reason why you don't you don't say try here is because you know that gold is positive one. The cyanos are negative one a piece or so negative four. So right away, just based on what you have in the formula, that complex is negative three. Therefore, you don't need to say how many potassiums you need to counterbalance the negative three. You need three automatically. So you don't, you're not redundant. You don't say try potassium. You just say potassium because if you need to figure it out in the formula, you can figure it out based on its counter ions. It's got to be three potassiums. That's the only way uh, negative three is going to be counterbalanced by, by uh, the cations. You need three potassiums. So that right there is the name for this particular compound. Okay, that's the name. Uh, potassium tetracyan tetracyano aureate. Notice I use the Latin name, aureum. I could also, I, I will also accept gold tape. It's kind of weird but that, that would be acceptable if you don't know the Latin name and you know the English name. I mean, arium and gold are the same in, in chemistry, but you guys probably are not exposed to Latin. And so uh, I would also accept gold, gold tape for this particular, but you need to have an ATE. So this is just a summary of the rules that I just talked to you guys about, okay? So uh, you need to practice this. And for those of you in lab, take a look at activity number 12. I think that's coordination chemistry. And practice, the, uh, there's some nomenclatures in there. Okay. So here are certain elements that have been known for the longest time and who have each have either Latin or Greek names. These have either Latin or Greek names. Let me clear this. The symbol for iron is not IR. IR is iridium. The symbol for iron is FE. And that's because the, um, the, the, 
the Greek or the Latin name is ferris. So if you're going to make this an anion, it would be called a ferrate. Lead is not LB, it's actually PB, okay? Uh, that's plumbate, plumium. Uh, gold, again, if these are anionic, now these are anionic, meaning that they're, they're part of a metal complex that's negatively charged. Copper's cuprate, silver's arginate, and tin is tannate. Okay, so, so again, the, these are not common English names. They come either from the Greek or the Latin um, or original name. So let's take a look at another uh, example. This one, I'm going to write the formula based on the name. And again, you want to break it down. You, you want to say, okay, there's six amines. So NH3, six times. Always the subscript is after the, the um, symbol, okay? The six tells you there's six amines, six NH3. And then uh, that's the only ligand you have. Then you have chromium, and the chromium happens to be a positive three. And then you have a nitrate, NO3, okay? So this particular um, formula would be CR, you don't write the charge, NH3, oops, um, yeah, the metal first, NH3, six, and then a bracket to indicate that's within the coordination sphere. And then you've got nitrate. Let me clear this real quick. You have nitrate, NO3. But that would be wrong because the chromium is positive three, okay? Amines are neutral. That means the counter ion has to be negative three. The only way you're gonna get negative three on your nitrate is put a three right there, okay? It's gonna be NO3 parentheses three. So, so that would be the uh, formula for, for nitrate or this comp particular compound. You got to have it electrically neutral. Let's take a look at the next one. Dichloro, let me erase this real quick. Dichloro means Cl2. Uh, Bisethylene diamine. So there's two ethylene diamine. There's two ethylene diamine. Um, and when you have ethylene diamine, don't write it as uh, the way we would draw it out. Okay, don't write NN. That's how we would draw it out in um, the structure, but this is the formula. So you would write EN, EN, and then there's two of them because there's a bis, and then there's a platinum, PT, but that platinum is a four, and then there's a bromine. How many bromines? Well, you have to figure that out. You know that the platinum is plus four, you know that ethylene diamines are zero and there's chlorines are negative one. So that's negative two a piece or negative two total. So the cation portion and the first part is always the cation portion is going to be positive two. That can only be balanced by two bromines. So you're going to have to write BR2 as a counter ion. Okay, it's got to be electrically neutral. So Let's take a look at this name. You would certainly say uh, PTEN2Cl. Again, neutral, neutral ligands. ENs neutral before anionic. So it'd be PTEN2Cl2 bracket. That's within the coordination sphere. And we know that whole thing is positive two because the chlorines are negative one apiece and the platinum's positive four. So we need two bromines like that. Okay, let's take a look at the last one. This one is a little bit tricky, but they are common. They are common. You got two ethylene diamines, and then you have a uh, zinc, and that zinc is plus two right there. Okay, and then that right there is the cation, and then the anion is 
tetraiodo. So you have four iodines. Mercurate, which means that the mercury complex is the anion. anion. It's Hg, the symbol for mercury, and it's a positive two. Okay, so let's take a look at this right here. This right here is a, each iodine is negative one, so that's negative four and a positive two. That whole, whole thing is negative two. This whole thing is negative two. That means that the um, cation has to be positive two, and indeed that's the case. The ethylene diamines are neutral, the zinc is plus two, so that means that this whole thing is positive two. So positive two, negative two, it's a neutral compound. That, that's a salt, okay? You can have a salt in which the cation is a co metal complex and the anion is a metal complex as well. Just remember that the, if the anion is a metal complex, you got to end the metal with an A-T-E ending. So that's why it's called mercurate, mercurate, okay? Mer mercurate right there. So how do we write the formula? Again, cation before anion. Let me clear this. Okay, cation before anion. Metal first, followed by the ligand, two. Bracket, and then another bracket because that's a complex and iodines are within the coordination sphere. HGI4. The anion's negative two, the cation's positive two. Okay, so that's how you would uh, write the formula for this. Here are more metal complex that are the name you would use if it's anionic. Osmium would be osmate. Antimony would be antimonate. Uh, platinum would be platinate. Cobalt would be cobaltate. Rhenium would be renate. Uh, rhodium would be rhodate. Iridium would be ir irradiate. Irradiate, radiate. Okay, radiate. If you had iridium as um, part of a metal complex that's anionic, so um, that that basically is is how you do this. You need to practice. It takes practice, just like you practice in naming regular. Uh, compounds back in 152 and 200, you need to practice this right here. Okay, so that pretty much takes care of uh, the first part of coordination chemistry. Okay, I kind of explained in this particular part what a metal complex is. It's basically a transition metal or a metal that has ligands. The d orbitals are used to accommodate those pair of electrons. Uh, then you have different geometry depending on how many ligands that you're going to have attached. We call that um, the coordination sphere. Um, within the coordination sphere, how many, what the coordination number is and what the ligand number is. And then we went into naming these things or writing the formula. So